So welcome. My name is Valerie Mason John and I'm your moderator for today. And we will begin with a minute's silence. Let's have a minute's silence for George Floyd, Regis Koshinsky Pakwe, and the many black and brown bodies that have been killed by the police and for the disproportionate loss of black and brown bodies who have died around the world in the COVID-19 pandemic. A minute silence. And now, land acknowledgements. Those of you listening in from Canada, let's all acknowledge the unceded territories which we live upon right now. I'm here sitting on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, tsleil and Seashelt Nations people. I'm also acknowledging that we are able to be here via our phones and laptops today due to the stolen minerals mined from African soil that have been used to build our gadgets. Some Zoom etiquette. The drop down blue bar is for all panelists and attendees. If you want to say something to everyone or give your comments, then please use that function and there will be a function for questions later. So welcome, thank you all for coming. And thank you to all the panelists and to our Zoom maestro for making this happen. What a paradoxical twist. In 2015, the United Nations announced the International Decade for People of African Descent. We are halfway through. United Nations, can you hear us loud and clear? My name is Valerie Mason John. I'm a first generation Canadian who was pulled to Canada seeking a better life. My ancestors were pushed to Canada during the loyalist years of the 1700s. Some were slaves, others indentured servants, and some free in inverted commas. Then there are the black refugees who fled slavery in America to Nova Scotia in 1812. There are also the slaves who escaped during the 1850s and 60s via the Underground Railroad in Canada. African Canadians have been here as early as the 1600s. There were slave auctions here and public lynchings too. Last week, the world witnessed a public lynching, the helplessness and humiliation of the death of an innocent black man. As the Reverend Al Sharple said at the George Floyd Memorial, his death is the story of all black folk. In Al Sharple's words, the reasons we are marching around the world is we are like George Floyd, because we cannot breathe, not because something is wrong with our lungs, it's because you couldn't take your knee off our necks. As I sit here, I can feel the policewoman's hand being rammed up my crutch, looking for dangerous weapons while singled out on an anti-Nazi march age 14. Many of us have had that knee on our neck and died at the hands of the police, but guess what? We didn't have the cameras to prove it. 
the George Floyd family lawyer, Benjamin Crump, reminds us that we as black people in the diaspora have been living with the pandemic of racism and discrimination for centuries. Today, we have a gathering of African Canadians who will speak about our experience. Today, we put the spotlight on, oh, Canada. It's time for us to rise up and say, get your knees off our black necks. Because right now, black people in the diaspora cannot breathe and we can all feel that policeman's knee on our neck. When you say you don't see color, we cannot breathe. When you say we are all the same, we cannot breathe. When you say the deaths of George and Regis are rare, we cannot breathe. When you say white people experience racism too, we cannot breathe. When you say you have black friends and you're not racist, we cannot breathe. When you say there is no systemic racism in Canada, we cannot breathe. When a police car passes us, we cannot breathe. When we can tell our black community that we can trust the police will treat us appropriately. When we can say, don't worry, the police are here to protect you and not kill you, we will be able to breathe again. Let's get up and stand up for our rights. So we begin with the icebreaker, calling in all the panelists today, George Elliott Clark, Afua Cooper, Neil, Melinda Smith, Adil, Handel Wright, Matt Thomas. And we're gonna begin with an icebreaker. So I'm gonna ask each panel the same question and they have a minute to answer. George, what is anti-Black racism? Anti-Black racism is very simple. It's the attempt to immobilize us uh, in terms of our class position, in terms of our social political position, uh, as being in uh, an underclass, as being marginalized, as being disempowered. That's the whole purpose of anti-Black racism. Anti-Black racism is the error of slavery. Once slavery was abolished or once emancipation occurred, it was still necessary to try to keep us as a captive population that, will do, that would do all the dirtiest, um, most uh, uh, unskilled, uh, but still essential labor uh, to keep the society functioning. That's true in the US, true in Canada, true throughout the Western world, in the Caribbean, South America, wherever there was slavery, wherever there was dispossession of black people, uh, and whenever that was legally ended, legally ended, anti-black racism rose up uh, to replace the slavery that had been legally eliminated, uh, thanks to all the struggles of African peoples and, and our ancestors and their allies to overturn that system. But instead okay, one of- One minute up, one minute up, one minute. Straight. Thank you. Okay. Afua, what is anti-black racism? Turn your mic, turn, your, turn on your mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So oh, what George said is perfect, Valerie. I, I won't add to that. It's a question of power. It's a question of power that's woven in through all the structures in society that, um, that is mobilized ag against black people. I know my minute is short. I'll take the rest of the time really to acknowledge Africa because as black people within Africa or in the diaspora, I think it's important to acknowledge the African continent because this is from where, it, 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 where we came from as people. And you mentioned rightly how Africa has been pillaged to build the wealth of the world. So I acknowledge Africa as a mother of all creation and human life. Even though Africa has suffered untold and unacknowledged, unacknowledged miseries she continues to ascend. Africa and her people still demand reparations for such atrocities as the slave trade, slavery, colonialism, and global anti-blackness. Thank you. Neil, what is anti-black racism? Turn your mic on. Okay, can you hear me? 
yeah. yeah, man, PCR. Um, anti-black racism to me is like, you know, loving and profiting off of black culture, but not loving black people. Um, you know, just to continue off of what was said before, you know, anti-black racism is really policies and practices embedded within institutions that reflect and reinforce, you know, prejudices, um, stereotypes, discrimination um, directed at people of African descent and, um, yeah, you know, rooted in colonization and, and, and all that. And I definitely believe that we definitely have to have that focus on Africa because a lot of those, those teachings and histories were taken from us. So that's what we got to do, man. We got to build. Thank you. Melinda, what is anti-black racism? Turn your mic on. For me, anti-black racism exists because colonialism and slavery existed. And so it impacts people of African descent, black people, wherever they exist around the world, including in Canada, United States, UK, and elsewhere. And it is inextricably connected to systems, structures, processes, attitudes, belief systems that flow from colonial racism. Anti-black racism is directed at, at people, all, all people of African descent, and it's important to note, regardless of class, creed, national origin, it happens to black people by virtue of being black. Most discussions of racism focus on individual, on individual intentionality, on whether one can be both nice person or a racist, all with the aim of rescuing an individual from responsibility and accountability. But I, it's important to stress that anti-Black racism is a system. So everyone in that system is shaped by it. To draw on Memi's distinction of the colonized and colonized, even the colonizer who refuses benefits. So even the anti-Black racist benefits and all Black people by virtue of anti-Black racism are disadvantaged in the system. Thank you. Adil. What is anti-Black racism? Turn your mic on. So I, I don't want to add to the definitions that were already provided, but I would say that anti-Black racism is something that we're not yet comfortable talking about in Canada. I think um, after the killing of George Floyd, there was a lot of op-eds and, and speeches about systemic racism, but not about anti-Black racism. And I think that has to do with our understanding of Canada or idealization of Canada as the last stop in the Underground Railroad um, and our reluctance to really come to terms with our participation in slave trade. So anti-Black racism is something we're not um, coming to terms with in Canada. Thank you. Handel, what is anti-Black racism? So I think um, most folks have said um, really interesting things and very good things about how we might want to define it. I would just add that um, anti-Black racism is a continuation of the stereotyping of Africans wherever they might be, both on the continent and outside. So if you take the stereotypes of people being loud, dangerous, violent, overly sensitive, stupid, aggressive, promiscuous, you put all those things together, they become the profile of what black people are. And you use that on an individual basis as your prejudice, and you use that systematically. So in systems, in institutions, we are underqualified, we are demanding, we are not a good fit, we make others uncomfortable, we are not leadership material, we are quota hires. And so in the nation, anti-black racism means that you are always new to Canada. You don't fit in well in Canada. You're ungrateful to the nation. These are the aspects that make up what it is that we're calling anti-Black racism. Thank you. Matt, what is anti-Black racism? Well, I'll, I'll just add, because uh, again, it's, uh, fantastic info has just been shared there by my peers, but um, immediate judgment on the content of a Black person's character because of the color of their skin. Okay, so that's all I'm going to add and stay within the 60 seconds. Thank you. Okay, next question. George, what is white privilege? Turn your mic on. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, white privilege is very simple. It's the ability to believe, to delude oneself that one inhabits a democracy, but that's okay. 
Because if you're white, you live in a democracy. You can expect to have your civil rights appreciated. Uh, nine times out of 10, unless you're poor or you're engaged in some kind of labor uh, unrest or, or strike action. Uh, but otherwise, you can afford to believe that uh, your vote counts, your rights are respected, the police will listen to you. That's what white privilege means. And it also means uh, ignorance of history. The ability to pretend that slavery never happened in Canada, the ability to pretend that there was no segregation here, the ability to pretend that, that black and brown and indigenous people uh, enjoy the same rights and opportunities and liberties as everybody else. And to uh, enact your privilege based on that misunderstanding of our own society. Thank you. Afua, what is white privilege? So white privilege for me has to do with the ease that white people has, this take for granted ease um, that they have been walking through the world. Uh, they don't have to worry. Uh, their skin color or race is not an issue. They can claim the world. I mean, if you think um, Amy Cooper in the Central Park, Karen, weaponized her white privilege. She knew she had white privilege when she made that phone call to say that, you know, an African-American man, Calvin Cooper, um, was threatening her and her dog. She knew when she made that call that the police would believe her because she weaponized his identity too as an African-American man. That had the police arrived, they would believe her and not him and he'd be probably carted off to jail or probably shot down. So for me, anti-black racism also goes hand in hand. Uh, I mean, white privilege goes hand in hand with anti-black racism. White privilege also comes out of racism. Historically, when we create these um, uh, societies in North America, these political constructs, which were built on slavery, colonization, and at the heart of it was anti-black racism. Ashe, Ashe. Neil, what is white privilege? Yeah, um, I feel like white privilege would be like, you know, the, um, the is, is, to, is to benefit, but not have like the burden of like pretty much like anything where it's like culture, resources, um, power dynamics, um, you know, and just like a, a simple analogy, it's like, you know, like walking into like Shoppers Drug Mart, not being followed, you know, um, going out to like get some Band-Aids, you know, and, and having Band-Aids that have like, you know, the complexion of your skin tone, because obviously that's, you know, the, the skin tone that's worth recognizing, you know, so <laughs> I'm gonna throw that out there. Thank you. Melinda, what is, white privilege? For me, white privilege um, is rooted again in colonialism and slavery and is inextricably connected to the con continuing colonial, colonial racism under which we live. Um, and so white people, for no other reason except the fact that they are of whiteness, privilege of whiteness, benefit from that. It is the unearned spoils, the booty, the bounty, the loot of uh, colonialism and slavery um, white privilege is what empowers ordinary white people, the Amy Coopers, the Barbecue Beckys, and the Karens of the world to use 911. Like it's a customer service line for white people to tell tales on black people for living while black. White privilege is rooted in colonial racism, is what underwrites the everyday policing and surveilling of black people to, to remind us that public spaces were designed for the benefit of white people. And therefore as black people, we are always already out of place. White privilege is the police stopping black people for driving, walking, reading while black, reminding us that under the white gaze, we do not belong. White privilege in universities is administrators and colleagues treating black professors as if they are the academic help, call upon to clean up the, the mess that they find themselves in. Thank you, thank you. Idil, what is white privilege? Oh, turn your, um, turn your mic on. Okay. Um, so I'm speaking to you from uh, Quebec, and uh, here, unfortunately, white privilege has become intertwined with nationalism. So whenever we try to address issues of racism in this province, um, it brings up issues of nationalism. So uh, unfortunately, the supremacy of the French language has become white supremacy. Um, so, so it's a, a whole different context here in Quebec where whenever we try to bring up issues uh, that Blacks are, are facing in Quebec, uh, we come up against um, nationalism. Thank you. 
handle what is white privilege? Well, white privilege is the ability to live a normal life. It means you are able to live your life uh, unconscious. You have an unconscious and disconscious number of benefits. And you don't know that these are benefits unless you look at somebody else who doesn't have them. I think my best definition, and it's very hard to talk about privilege. We end up talking about racism or discrimination. So privilege is the unconscious ways in which we, are, we benefit in society. I think Chris Rock gave one of the best uh, definitions of white privilege when he said, there's a white waiter right here in this room who is one-armed, and you ask him, will he change places with Chris Rock? He says, I'm rich, I'm famous. And you ask that white waiter, and he'll say, oh, no, I'm going to ride out this white thing, see where it takes me. In other words, whiteness has no end to what it can achieve. But Chris Rock has supposedly hit the limit of what one can achieve as a black person. So it's going about living your life without recognizing that you have those benefits which others don't have. Thank you. Matt, what is white privilege? So um, an advantage that is afforded to a white person because of the color of their skin instead of the content of their character. Thank you. Okay, so the final question in this icebreaker. George, how do we experience anti-black racism and white privilege in Canada? Okay, um, I think it all has to do with the question of status. And I think everyone needs to recognize, all Canadians need to recognize that status is the most important word in Canadian bureaucracy in determining the value of each citizen according to his or her ethnicity, uh, a language spoken, uh, uh, race, of course, as well as gender, and, it's in, and of course, uh, immigrant or non-immigrant uh, status, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so uh, uh, white privilege is evinced in this category in terms of even if one is a very recent new Canadian, not having your origins questioned, not having your abilities questioned, Whereas if you are black, your status, even if your residency or a connection to Canada goes back centuries, let alone several generations, is to have your belonging questioned, your rights questioned, your presence questioned, your ability questioned, your status questioned at every and any given moment. Thank you. Afua. How do we experience anti-black racism and white privilege in Canada? Always, for me, if you look at um, what happens in academia, the people, the, the majority of the professors, of the administrative staff, of the students, um, but perhaps more importantly, what's on the curriculum? White studies is centered. White studies is the canon. And if you go down the line to high school curriculum or middle school curriculum, um, there's hardly anything about black students. There's no requirement in the curriculum that people learn about black history, even though black people have been in this country for over 400 years. So the curriculum is, is again a white curriculum. And for 50 years, Valerie, or more, 60 years, I should say, since 1957, when black communities across Canada started agitating at the school board level for a black history or black studies content. The second way in Canada is the over incarceration of black people, especially black men within um, carceral institutions, prisons and jails. In the federal system right now over the past 10 years, there's been a 70, check this out, 70% increase of black male incarceration, even though black people as a whole only make up 3% of the population. Corrections Canada statistics, 70% increase. It's the highest rate for any group in this country. We Ashe. make up 3% of the population. Ashe. Neil, how do we experience black racism and white privilege in Canada? 
Yeah, so I have a quick story um, that literally happened two days ago. Um, a friend of mine, DJ Romeo, a black man was walking downtown Toronto in the Queens uh, Key area um, to be called the N-word by an irate white man um, who then goes on in the middle of the road to um, kick a vehicle, call other people the N-word, and even physically assaulting a streetcar standing in the, in the, you know, in the middle of the road causing all kinds of um, racial slurs for over a 15 minute period. Um, not to mention there's a police station literally a block away. Um, eventually he was confronted by officers blatantly resisting arrest even technically assaulting an officer to eventually be held in an upright position by four officers without being threatened by guns, without being tasered, without being thrown down to the ground on his face. He was eventually placed in cruiser and taken away in custody only to be released the very next day. How do we know this? Because my same brother, DJ Romeo, saw the same guy on the streetcar the very next day and he has this all documented. That was two days ago. Thank you. Adil. How do we experience anti-Black racism and white privilege in Canada? Well, I think uh, part of it is which problems get addressed by authorities or uh, institutions. So Amy Cooper knew that uh, her concerns, her problems would be addressed swiftly and effectively by authorities. And I think uh, as a Black Canadian, I know that um, our problems won't. Uh, there's supposed to be a provincial investigation or commission on systemic racism in Quebec. It was canned uh, because our problems aren't considered to be as important. That's why we have um, report after report about police profiling, about uh, systemic racism, but there's no action uh, because action has to do with power and, um, you know, who has power. Thank you. Handel, how do we experience anti-Black racism and white privilege in Canada? Um, privilege. Um, white people can go about their lives um, normally. Um, you can look at the history books, you can look at um, different curriculum, as Afua has said, and you realize that white studies is passing off as Canadian studies. So when we say Canadian studies, basically we mean white studies. Um, you can choose to acknowledge or not acknowledge issues of race and racism. It's a choice. You don't want to get into those things. You don't have to. Um, you can know that you belong in the nation. The nation looks like you and you look like the nation. In terms of anti-Black racism, you're afraid for your kids, even from when they are young, about when exactly they're going to experience racism, when it is you're going to have the talk with them. So this is not a choice for us at all. You're, you're afraid that you're not judged by your abilities. Um, you know that you, you are told, even from colonial times in Africa, you know that you need to be twice as good to get half as far. So you're always doing twice as good. Thank you. Matt, what is anti-Black racism and white privilege? In, yeah, in, in, my, in my situation and in my environment, it, it's been invited to the table, but invited to the table to make up the numbers without actually putting anything or being listened to at that table. Um, I'm visually being seen, but not being heard. Um, my perspective, my views are always disregarded. Um, by various groups. So to, to put it short, that it's, it's to be seen, but not heard. Thank you. Melinda, what is anti-black racism? How do we experience anti-black racism and white privilege in Canada? I think uh, in, in all systems, uh, education system, uh, criminal justice systems, uh, 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 across uh, sectors, we experience a tyranny of low expectations. Um, the ways in which blackness is, construct is constructed as lack, lacking uh, intelligence, lacking uh, um, what it is necessary to fit. We are expelled from the history books in the schools and we are ex we expelled from the curriculum in universities. We are underrepresented in universities, which means then that black uh, student, I mean, all students can go through universities without ever having a black professor. It also means then that any history of Africa, the diaspora, 
can only be seen through the white gaze, a, a, a gaze. So black, blackness, in a, in a way, always, we are the faces at the bottom of the well, so to speak. Um, and, and, and that means then that anytime we engage, it's often as tokenism or, or uh, as, in, as um, the, the beneficiary of white largesse. Thank you. Okay, so thank you panelists um, for that icebreaker. Um, I, yeah, just thank you. As you can see from the comments, um, it's been really informative. So um, before I introduce George Elliot Clark, I'm actually going to ask George to do a poem for us and then I will introduce him after. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to be reading a poem from this book, uh, Excuse the Advertisement, uh, Canticles 1, Volume 2. And uh, uh, the first poem is Harlan Pamphlet, 1943, supposedly by Langston Hughes, the great African-American poet. It rhymes that skull gaunt cops presume privilege to murder as mourners allege to shoot down black boys, not white toughs. But kids, wrists too skinny for handcuffs, warns us that white police perceive emancipation as a sieve, setting too many Negroes free from slavers' plantations. Cops see our suppression as their mission. Police repeal abolition. Every shot dead Negro attests to anti-liberty's success. Every cop who slays a nigger rates justice with gun snout vigor. And very quickly, I want to switch over to this uh, COVID-related poem. Unprecedented is the death rattle in each individual throat, bereft of the rebel's raucous growl. Unprecedented in their clipped enumeration counting shrouds as lumpy as snow is Brit accent signaling the cadaver broadcasting corporation. Unprecedented is the mass muting, the excising of shouted turmoil, save for the Caucasian viral video COPVID20, COPVID20, in revealing the Ku Klux Klan cop culture kneeling bodily on a black man's neck so he can't breathe, as with COVID-19, unprecedented. Thank you very much, George. Um, welcome to our final panelist who's just arrived, Rico. Um, and so now we are going to move into the next part. Each panelist has been given five minutes to, to respond to, yeah, just to the, 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 the pandemic, the international uprisings. So first, I'm going to bring on George. George Elliott Clark, Dr. George Elliott Clark is the fourth Poet Laureate of Toronto, 2012 to 15, and the seventh Parliamentary Canadian Poet Laureate, 2016 to 17. George Elliott Clark was born in Windsor, Nova Scotia in 1960. Educated at several universities in Canada, Clark is also a pioneering scholar of African Canadian literature with two major tomes to his credit, Odyssey's Home, Mapping African Canadian Literature, and Direction's Home, Approaches to African Canadian Literature. A professor of English at the University of Toronto, Clark has taught at Duke, McGill, the University of British Columbia, and Harvard. He holds eight do honorary doctorates plus appointments to the Order of Nova Scotia and the Order of Canada at the rank of officer. He has won numerous awards, including the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellows Prize, the Governor's General's Award of Poetry. And I could say much more. Thank you so much, George. Over to you. Five you, minutes. Valerie. Um, uh, where to begin? Uh, it's interesting that we have this confluence of of the absolute uh, spectacle of the police murder, apparently, of George Floyd. And at the same time, it's in the midst of this global pandemic. It's interesting that the, that the uh, uh, slogan, which has arisen in the movement of protest, is, we can't breathe, uh, which actually that slogan connects together the impact of the coronavirus, COVID-19, 
along with the oppression that so many of us experience uh, from police and other authorities. Uh, and it's also interesting to me that, uh, that uh, the impact of, of white uh, racism, anti-black racism, along with the over-policing of black and brown and indigenous communities is the same. Uh, that is to say, it's immobilizing. The idea that we have to shelter in place, self-isolate, practice social distancing uh, is related in a sense, and I keep in mind that, that the health ne uh, necessities are important here, but it's interesting that they correlate uh, accidentally, but also conveniently with the whole apparatus of, of suppression of black rights, suppression of black existence, which is the whole importance, the whole uh, uh, reason, rationale for anti-black racism. It comes back to what I was saying at the very beginning. The most important rights for black people and brown people, indigenous people, especially black people, arising out of the struggle against slavery were two. Two rights that came out of that struggle that were so important. Mobility rights. It's important for us to recognize that, that freedom for black people meant being able to move without being coerced, without being surveilled, without being watched, without being uh, countermanded, without being pinned up, arrested, imprisoned, and so on. Uh, and of course, the other second right that came out of abolition uh, was the custody, the right to have our, our, our significant other, our spouses, and, and to have them with us, uh, so long as there's mutual love and so on. And of course, children, the right to actually be able to have our children and raise them for ourselves. And both of these rights have been significantly interfered with ever since abolition, ever since emancipation. And as my poem is trying to argue, trying to suggest, the role of the police in our, in our societies, America and Canada, and internationally as well, wherever Black people have been oppressed, is essentially to continue that oppression by checking our mobility rights and checking our custody rights. This brings into the role uh, brings into question the role of, of child uh, protection services, which I know are important, but also have a disproportionate effect on Black and Indigenous people, especially right here in Canada. And also, of course, the role of our ability to be able to live where we want to live, walk where we want to walk, drive where we want to drive, to have that house, to have that car, to have that job. Our mobility rights are constantly questioned, and that is what, uh, as well as our child custody rights, are constantly questioned. And that is what keeps us in a state of terror, in a police state. I was saying earlier that one of the advantages of white privilege is that you believe, if you're white, that you live in a democracy. No sane, no sane black person or brown person or indigenous person can believe, can dare to believe that we live in a democracy. We don't. We live in a police state. We live in a police state. And the only way to end that, for everybody's benefit, white, black, brown, red, yellow, the only way to end that oppression is to put the police under strict, I mean super strict, uh, uh, civilian control. I don't want us to have to go around saying we can't breathe. I want the police to say that they can't breathe. I think that every police officer should have an invisible leash around his or her neck, which is controlled by the people, controlled by the citizenry. The police should not be able to breathe without permission from us. The police should not be able to fire a weapon or use a weapon without permission from the people. The ultimate authority over the police in a democracy is with the people. And until we have that actual control, none of us live in a democracy. We all live in a police state where the police are not under anybody's effective control, except their own unions. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Ashe, Ashe. So next to the square table, I introduce Dr. Afua Cooper. Afua Cooper, Professor of Black History at Dalhousie University and Halifax Poet Laureate 2018-2020. She is cross-appointed to departments of history and sociology and social anthropology, faculty of graduate studies, gender and women's studies, she is the immediate past president of the Black Canadian Studies Association, chair of the Lord Dalhousie Scholarly Panel on Slavery and Race, lead author on the report on Lord Dalhousie's History on Slavery and Race, 2019, author of The Hanging of Angelique, 
the untold story of slavery in Canada and the burning of old Montreal. Dr. Agua Cooper. Unmute. Yeah, thank you to all Valerie and to all the panelists. And I just want to add to that I have a new book coming out. Um, it's called Black Matters. Uh, Poetry and Photography in Dialogue with Wilfred Rosart from Bielefeld University in Germany. And it's gonna be published by Fernwood. And Willie, I believe, is on this call. And the topic is, is so appropriate to what we are talking about, the book of poetry and photography. I think Lauren has the information and she'll, she'll put it out there. But I, I, I wanna begin with black invisibility or how we, do we combat black invisibility? Because with all the news items, you turn, even our own Canadian TV stations and radio stations, the focus is on the United States. There's very little about blackness in Canada or about what black people are experiencing in Canada at the hand of criminal justice in this case. And part of the reason for that, I, it, it goes back to our history of slavery and colonialism, which was covered over. When we had um, confederation in 1867, the Canadian provinces that confederated um, pretended as if there were, were no black people living in Canada, there was no slavery. Um, so that story was effectively erased, even as we have segregate, had segregated black communities throughout Canada, whether it's from BC to, to, to Nova Scotia. So the, the anti-black racism you could see bubbling up from, from slavery into this post-emancipation era with our history and our stories effectively covered over or, or marginalized in some cases. The unfortunate, uh, another unfortunate uh, fact is that we're next door to the United States. It's a juggernaut. It eats up everything. It eats us up. If a, a black man is shot in the States, it's get the press, the, the press. If a black man is shot in Toronto or Halifax, uh, maybe some Canadian news. But the Canadian structure, we see also that we, you know, in our federal government has deliberately, in my view, in light of the fact that we have the decade, the United Nations decade, in light of the fact that three years ago, the human, um, UN Human Rights Working Group came to Canada and investigated the condition of life in Black Canada and made all these recommendations, including apologizing for slavery, um, setting up a Department of African Can Canadian Affairs, setting up structures that would um, eliminate racial profiling and stop this massive inflow of black people into prisons. In spite of that, uh, a silence. So as has been said earlier on, the Canadian state is complicit in trampling on black people's rights and also, you know, um, in, in, in overseeing or, or a death. We see the, the situation in Toronto with, with um, Regis Porchinsky Paquette, how she died after a police interaction. Um, but before that, we saw Sophia Cook being, being shot and wounded because of a stop and frisk. We see um, Jermaine Carby, who was also murdered, shot and killed by the police because of racial profiling. We see a young man, a teenager, he was 18 years old by the name of Junior Alexander Manon in 2010, who was killed in, in, in Toronto by the police. And, and this is what the pathologist said. He died of positional asphyxia following struggle and exertion. He was beaten on the head by the cops with a police radio, and he was put in a chokehold so he couldn't breathe. And we have so many of these parallels to what happened in George Floyd in, in Minneapolis in Canada. It doesn't get the play. It doesn't get the play. But I also want to say that, um, you know, since 1976 and even before 1976 with the murder of um, Albert Johnson and later on with Lester Donaldson and just the dozens and dozens of, of, of black men who have been killed, uh, for whom we have record, of whom we have record. And remember, Valerie, and all of you who, who are listening, we don't know how many black men have been killed by police. The police has destroyed certain records. In Canada, we do not keep race-based data. 
So if you want to know, you have to go and, and, and get a patchwork of certain sources and put it together. But what we know is that dozens and dozens of black men and boys and some women have been murdered and killed by police. Andrew Loco, Abdurrahman Abdurrah Abdi was beaten to death by the two cops in front of his apartment. The thing is, most of these cops got away. Even if they faced the judge, eventually they were exonerated. I just want to say something, and I want us to pay homage to Colin Kaepernick because he sacrificed a lot. He took the knee. He was fired from his job. He was called SOB by Donald Trump. And um, he received a, a lot of hateration. And today, Kaepernick must be just sitting back and say, oh, y'all catch up now. Because guess what? The NFL commissioner who fired him are now taking a knee. So now we have to be suspicious of this taking a knee thing. Because we see NFL commissioners taking a knee. We see prime ministers taking a knee. We even see Toronto police chief, a black man who seemed to didn't have any regard for black people taking a knee. So you know why? They are afraid of the power of the people. People have power. Hey, power to the people. The power is in people. And they realize that people are marching Ashe. forward and Ashe. are not backing down. Ashe. Ashe. Junior, Junior Alexander Manan, he died and he was also saying, I can't breathe. 18 year old kid, okay, from Scarborough. Thank you. Ashe. The next person I bring to the square table is Neil Logic Donaldson. Neil is a father artist and community leader. He is the founder of Stolen from Africa, an arts education organization and lifestyle brand in Toronto. Stolen from Africa focuses on work with marginalized youth within the school board and community. Neil is also the co-host for the Black Don't Crack podcast that shares stories on the various intersections of the Black experience in Toronto. His work ethic has landed him speaking engagements at Wilfrid Laurier University, Queen's University and the University of Toronto, along with featured interviews with the Toronto Star, Globe and Mail, MTV and Much Music. Neil Logic Donaldson. Oh man, peace, man, peace. I'm so glad to be here, man. First and foremost, I gotta, you know, shout out George Elliott Clark and Afua Cooper, about to have me catching the Holy Spirit, man, and speaking in tongues, man, just getting me amped. Um, I also just want to say, you know, I'm just honored to be part of this, you know, alongside with some of these OGs. Um, I really feel that the work of Stolen from Africa is literally built on, on their shoulders. So I'm, I'm really um, definitely happy to be here. Um, and then secondly, man, I just want to, you know, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know who's listening to this, but I just want to, you know, shout out to everyone who's here, man. So greetings, bonjour, hola, wagwan, you know, Toronto's in the building. We're out here. Um, so let me just talk about some of the stuff that's been happening um, in Toronto that, that we're focused on, which is primarily around youth. Um, so Solar from Africa's um, focus um, is, is Black youth. We recognize that Black students in Toronto and around the world are feeling inspired by anti-Black racism rallies and protests and happening globally. I mean, even the Amish community came out to protest. Take that in. <laughs> but um, we're uh, also feeling triggered by the current and past experiences of racism and discrimination happening not only um, in our communities, but also in schools. So our response to the pandemic um, has been threefold, focusing on youth, parents, and Black-led organizations. Um, our response to the pandemic has been centered around Black youth. Um, COVID has definitely amplified existing inequalities, impacts in Black communities. Um, as, as we all know, we are amongst um, the most marginalized within society and have to face additional barriers um, of access and support. Um, the majority of our Afrocentric programming and social services supports take place in schools during school hours. So you can imagine the challenges that, that we're facing um, and just like delivering programs, but uh, not just delivering programs, but also supporting youth um, through advocacy and resource sharing on uh, to these critical times. Um, parents are also overwhelmed um, trying to navigate home life while supporting kids um, through online learning and the pressures that come to it due to the fear and lack of knowledge of knowing their rights as students and parents. Um, we've been working on advocacy resources and I'll, and I'll share that. Actually, I think I uh, was shared in the, in the comments as well, and which I'll speak on to um, a little bit more. Um, as, far, as far as organizations, we've aligned ourselves with many Black organizations who serve Black youth um, who have found themselves in the same boat. Um, this was like a natural and beautiful movement that occurred um, of organizations coming together to figure out what we can do collectively, whether you're in the arts, health, employment, legal services, or, or, or um, leadership. 
Um, this also includes another advocacy collective that we're part of called um, Black to the Future, love that name. Um, this is a community of practice. Um, this is an action plan that was created about two years ago to combat the multidimensional existence of anti-Black racism in Toronto, and this is supported by the city. So it's kind of interesting how that um, Ford guy, our, our premier, um, was talking about how you know we don't have anti-Black uh, racism issues here. But anyways, um, many organizations have been unable to respond to these um, growing needs within the existing frameworks and are looking for innovative ways to respond and keep the people that they're serving, servicing engaged and feeling supported during this deep time of isolation. Um, increased programming and services are needed more than ever. So um, as a response to COVID, the Black Future um, Black to the Future initiative um, has advocated on behalf of 36 Black-led organizations for COVID emergency funds. Um, the, this request totaled for um, 1.5 million and it's um, actually in process right now. Um, currently, we're also beginning the um, second year of our Black Youth um, Collaborative, which consists of 17 youth from various marginalized communities in Toronto, including Jane Finch, Regent Park, and Malvern. Our goals are to develop a framework for schools and community groups to create safer alternative education spaces that celebrate, affirm, culturally engage, heal, nurture, and grow the skills of Black and racialized youth to form new strengthening, to form new and strengthen existing key stakeholder partnerships to collect, to gather, and publicly share essential information, knowledge, and stories of how Black youth and families are experiencing marginalization within the system, to identify new and existing systems to evaluate and measure the safety of safety and, and positive school climate for Black students experienced in a learning environment, and also to lay down, uh, also to lay down the groundwork for a community-based, community-coordinated coalition that can advocate for and inform effective, sustainable system change strategies that address systemic gaps in achievement, opportunities, and participation experiences by Black students. That being said, on top of all that, we have created an agency advisory network of about 45 Black youth or, or Black-led um, organization that are servicing Black youth across Toronto because we recognize that we cannot adequately support Black youth without the wraparound supports of various um, organizations. We need everybody. So that I say all this to say that um, Tuesday, June 16th, we're having a Know Your Rights on the streets and in the classroom panel for Black students, parents, and organizations to share questions about um, legal um, questions, things around the education system and um, anti-Black racism. The link is in the uh, chat, so you can join that and that's what's up. <laughs> Ashe, thank all you. Right. Next. I bring to the square table, Dr. Melinda Smith. Melinda is a professor of political science at the University of Alberta and the incoming inaugural Vice Provost, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Calgary. She is a co-editor of the forthcoming Nuances of Blackness in the Academy, Teaching, Learning and Researching While Black published by the University of Toronto Press. She is co-author of The Equity Myth and co-editor of five books. She is a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Fellow. She has won numerous awards, including in 2020, Susan S. Northcutt Award, Women's Caucus for International Studies, International Studies Association, and 2020, the Rosalind Smith Professional Award, National Black Coalition of Can of Canada Society. Over to Melinda, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I too want to acknowledge uh, that we are in the UN decade for people of African descent. Uh, we are in the UN decade for people of African descent. And to put, and, and to begin with a comment on the report that was written in October 26 by a fact-finding mission by the UN Human Rights Commission's working group uh, of experts on people of African descent. The sobering report highlighted how legacies of colonialism and slavery, which I've been emphasizing, continue to reverberate within Canada, Canadian institutions, and across borders, across the broader societies. These often unacknowledged and ongoing social legacies inform anti-Black racism and racial stereotypes that are so deeply entrenched in institutions, policies, and practices that its institutional and systemic forms are either functionally normalized or rendered invisible." Close quote. 
Moreover, the report says, to quote, the contemporary form of racism replicates the historical conditions and effects of spatial segregation, economic disadvantage, and social exclusion. Among the other things uh, the report called for, as Afua Cooper noted, was that the Canadian government consider creating a federal department of African affairs, apologize for slavery, make reparations, and build a monument recognizing the contributions of African Canadians. Very little movement has been made on these initiatives. My view is that uh, African Canadians or Black or diasporic Africans, um, as George Elliot Clark has written, um, there is no one single nomenclature for, but that, that we are actually shaped by Black multiplicity. Um, despite the fact too, that the profiling and stereotyping of Black people as a DJ knows, leads to a single story and that the danger of that story is not so much that it's, the, it's untrue, rather a single story invariably rests on a stereotype. So whether African Nova Scotian, Africadian, Caribbean, Caribbean, Canadian, Afro, Latina, Indigenous, Black, Black, Queer, and, and various alliances, what we see is the continuing devaluation of Blackness. And so on the prairies, I want to emphasize that the Black population has been here uh, for centuries. It has uh, uh, over a century. Black people have been part of the fur trade agreement. Black people, uh, historic communities of Black people were, are in northern Alberta, including in uh, um, Athabasca region. Uh, the total school, there were all Black uh, baseball teams, schools, um, et cetera. And that the people in Alberta tried to expel Black populations to so keep them out through various legislative means. Black people were kept out of pools, they were banned from schools, and as the work of Bashir Muhammad has, point, uh, has revealed clearly um, the, the prevalence of the Ku Klux Klan, supporting mayoral candidates, uh, the failure to account for the Black Civil Rights Movement. My own work has focused on a pioneering um, Black Canadians in Alberta, such as Violet King, who was the first Black woman lawyer in Canada, and uh, Justice um, Jones, who was the first Canadian-born Black judge in Canada. Many people think the first born was in, in um, Ontario. What I'm speaking to is the fundamental erasure of Blackness and Black people from institutions on the prairies. The recent Stats Can Working Group on Black Canadians, of which I'm a part, as well as Carl Jones, I mean Carl James at York, has pointed out the ways in which the on the prairies, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, to less extent BC, and uh, in the West, the Black population are doubling. It's the fastest growing population in Canada. Uh, and yet you would not know this. Visible minorities constitute 37% of the population in, in cities like Calgary and Edmonton, which are two of the most diverse cities in Canada. People focus primarily on the Tom, you know, on Montreal, uh, and on Ontario, or in Halifax. But the Prairies also has this deep Black history and experiences. So the Black experience on the prairies often overlooked. We are underrepresented in institutions. We are underpaid. My own work has pushed in, in Canadian University, along with Jennifer Kelly and others, to increase representation of Black professors in the academy. I work in an institution where there are at most a dozen. This doesn't even get to the table, in large part because there is a dividing practice, I believe, which is true in Alberta as across Canada and universities. That dividing practice that says, oh, we are prioritizing indigenous peoples. You, we can't focus on you. And so indigenous scholars have come to the fore to say, wait a minute, you don't get to promulgate anti-black racism in our names. That the, the solidarity and the support are inextricably connected between indigenous and black peoples around colonialism and subjugation. So I'm interested in, in, in really thinking about these uh, subaltern histories of Black people on the prairies and the need for more attention to it. Ashe, thank you, Ashe. So next I bring to the square table, table is Russ Rico. Um, Russ Rico says, I am Russ Rico, Rostant A. Rico John. 
He is a member of the Black Action Defence Community, lead negotiator for ROM 11 against the Royal Ontario Museum, coordinator for Golden Lions of Winnipeg, and is a radio programmer producer, Fantastic Friday on CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg. Russ, please unmute yourself and speak. You need to unmute yourself, Russ. Lauren, can you unmute? Great, unmute, you're on, speak. Yes, thank you very much. And greetings to all the other panelists. Welcome and niceness just for all of us at this time. I want to talk about reaction and action. Our reaction to these 500 years of terror and these 500 years of abuse and action, whatever action we would like to take, what we organize with, between and among ourselves to take, rather than follow the edicts of what is the media that tell you how to demonstrate and uh, some of the government people who have been there all the time and coming out and saying they are with us, yet all the years, 500 years they've been there, they have done nothing to ameliorate the situation. A lot of young people are very, very angry. Number one, because they've lost connection with their community within the context of their parents, within the context of those who are intellectual leaders within our community. That disjointedness has caused misunderstanding, especially among younger people, on not only how to lead, but what to deal with in their leadership. Young people are willing and are ready to take up leadership and or assist with leadership. But what has happened is our intellectuals have, uh, um, I, I, I would say uh, from my perspective, disassociated themselves with, uh, with that so-called lower end of our community and the younger people are still trying to understand why their parents have talked about our pride and our history and yet bows down to atrocities committed by the white people. That is a very, very difficult thing for a lot of them to understand. And when they are ready to take action, their parents and some older people hold them back and say, no, don't do this. Yet they are supposed to take up the mantle to lead us into the next generation, if you want to call it. We have been under this, this terror for more than 500 years. Yet from generation to generation, we disassociate ourselves with the eagerness of the younger people to pick up the mantle. And in so doing, they help uh, 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 develop and maintain a generation gap. We have never had that in history. Generation gaps are only contingent upon the age group that they are training in. But yet we find ourselves nowadays being uh, uh, our children are separate from us. When we had events, our children used to be there with us. No matter what type of event we have, our children are there with us so they can learn. When we, when we come to Canada and other places like that and have been under the, 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 the thumb of the white man, what they have done is say that children can't be at this or can't be at that and dictate how our life should be. We have to take that back. That is action that we must take back. We have to rejoin our, our younger people in teaching them, in leading them, whether it's through heritage programs, whether it's through history, whether it's through science, we have to lead them in that. We, we shouldn't just leave, leave them to be arrested by police or beaten up by police or killed by police and then say we will get a lawyer or we are going to do a human rights um, thing to get some money from them. No, that is all over. Our younger people are eager to pick up the mantle. Let's hold hands with them and I'm talking about us older people and us intellectuals. Uh, let's hold hands with them, wherever they're going, whatever they're doing, and, and be able to connect with them. Let us continue to teach them our history, not some other person's history, their story. We must tell them our story, I and I story. Don't forget, it's only we ourselves can, can, can free ourselves. Nobody else will come and free us, and nobody has ever done it including no white God has come and freed black people from white people oppression. So we have a problem there when, when we follow in a God that has nothing to do with us, that has abandoned us, or if that God is there at all. But that's another subject. The key part of it here is we have to rebuild ourselves within the context of reconnecting with our youth. 
guiding them, teaching them, loving them, and participating with them with those things that we need to free ourselves. Not allow, whether it's the church or whether it's um, other government ministers, to come and tell us, no, well, you have to, um, if you do this, we will listen to you. If you pray, God will listen to you. If you come and talk to us, we will listen to you. Over 500 years we've been talking and talking to the point now that we can't even breathe. One love. Enough respect. Thank you, Ashe. Next, I bring to the square table Idil Issa. Idil Issa has worked in the startup and non-profit space in Qatar, Malaysia, South Africa and Canada. She writes frequently for outlets such as the Globe and Mail, Esquire Malaysia, Colors Magazine, Amazon Nerve Magazine, among others on issues touching race, religion and gender. She appears regularly on media outlets such as CBC and CTV to advocate for the rights of marginalized and oppressed populations with a focus on the intersectional experience of Muslim women of color. Idil, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm so honored, honestly, to be on this panel. I, uh, I mean, I can't even believe I'm on this panel with Dr. Fua and uh, George Elliott Clark and you, Valerie, and all of us, I, I'm honored. Um, I'm talking to you from uh, Montreal, and um, it's, a, it's a particular context here in Quebec. I think what I mainly want to focus on or bring to, to light is the way that electoral politics are, are playing into this in Quebec. So, of course, um, you know, with our whole constitutional um, evolution here in Canada, uh, Quebec is, has been deemed a distinct society. And so, um, you know, when it comes time for federal elections, uh, the Quebec vote is extremely important for federal parties. And that's why it's been difficult to get uh, many of the parties to do, you know, significant action to support issues uh, in terms of anti-racism uh, in Quebec. You know, the Liberals are, are reluctant to speak about it. Uh, the Conservatives are reluctant to speak about it because when it comes time for votes, uh, Quebec is extremely important. Uh, for example, in 2017, there was supposed to be a public consultation on systemic racism, but there was a by-election in the riding of Louis Hébert, uh, which was lost by the provincial liberal government, and they canned it immediately. So it just took the loss of one riding uh, in advance of the election for them to say, okay, you know, systemic racism, we're, we're going to file that for now. So electoral politics is, is really playing into this quite a bit, and I don't want people to know that. Um, in terms of our current government here in Quebec, uh, the Coalition Avenir Québec, the CAC, as we call them, um, they were definitely opposed to that public consultation on systemic racism. Uh, recently, they've announced they're going to look into racism, apparently, but I wouldn't trust any report that emerges from that party, given their history on this issue. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, been, it's been very difficult for us here in Quebec uh, because each time we try to approach this issue, uh, you know, we get pulled into this whole debate about nationalism. Um, it's, it, you know, there was the charter, the, the debate about the charter of values here in Quebec, which was long and drawn out over 10 years. Um, but each time they keep coming back with another, um, another law, another discriminatory law. And the reason is because, part of the reason is because they're using these as wedge issues. Uh, their base um, is largely white from, not from metropolitan Montreal, but what we call les régions. And so they are bringing up these issues, these wedge issues, uh, largely for electoral reasons to appeal to their base. So our issues are the things that we're talking about, police brutality, systemic racism, for them, they're looking at it as a wedge issue. They can use it, right? So, so that's what we're dealing with here in Quebec. It's, it's a really difficult uh, situation. I don't know if all Canadians know this, but multiculturalism in Quebec, it's like a swear word, okay? You, you, you're not supposed to be a multiculturalist. Uh, you can be an interculturalist, anti-culturalism, but a multiculturalist, no. 
So as soon as you start try, trying to talk about inclusion, you know, rights for black people in Quebec, you're a multiculturalist. So you're, you're an internationalist. So, you know, you're not for the, the cause of, of, you know, protecting the culture and language of Quebec. So it's a really complex uh, political arena to kind of advocate for the rights of black people within. Um, there, there's a lot of ignorance as well. Uh, many Quebecers are unaware or maybe willfully ignorant, but unaware that there was slavery in Quebec uh, and that we have that legacy here. Um, so, I mean, you know, I could use all the help I can get. Follow me, it's a lot to be. <laughs> Share my articles, let people know what's going on in Quebec because really it's a, it's a very difficult political terrain to deal with. Ashe. Thank you. Next, I bring to the square table, Dr. Handel Kashop Wright. He is a professor in the Department of Educational Studies and co-director of the Center for Culture, Identity and Education. His interdisciplinary research covers various topics from the theorization of research methodology to the evolution of continental and diasporic, diasporic African cultural studies, multiculturalism and decolonial thought. Professor Wright teaches courses in various areas, including research methodology, multiculturalism, anti-racism, cultural studies and social justice education. His service work in community includes work on the mayor of Vancouver's advisory on Black History Month and the City of Vancouver's Equity Advisory. At UBC, he serves in various capacities, including membership on the Vice Presidential Strategic Implementation Committee for Equity and Diversity, where he co-chairs the Race and Leadership Standing Committee. Welcome to Handle Right. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Valerie. I've been listening. Um, this is wonderful stuff from everybody. Um, Idil, I wish that you had been able to talk to my class about interculturalism um, when we covered it. This is wonderful stuff. I want to speak about the situation um, in British Columbia specifically. Um, it's hard being Black in Canada, we will all agree. It's particularly hard being Black in British Columbia, I would contend. Um, so the forms of anti-racism have fertile ground to grow and ease with which to work because of the geography, because of the history, and because of the population um, around blackness. So I'll be specific um, about British Columbia. And I want to say very specifically that beyond the grotesque, beyond these things about policing, the blatant racism, which does exist, I want to say that there are three ways in which racism works in the BC uh, context. One is through erasure, the other is through forgetting, and the third is through denial. And what makes racism work in those three ways, not to get to the fourth, which is blatant, virulent, episodic racism, is the geography. There is no black space in, uh, in, Vancouver, in the Vancouver area. So we have no Jane and Finch, we have no Rexdale, we have no La Salle, we have no Little Burgundy, we have no North Preston. So there is no there there for a presence of blackness. We do not have black space. So there is no black ethnoburb uh, in Vancouver. This makes a huge difference to who it is that, uh, to what it means to be black. In terms of the history of blackness, um, that black space was actually leveled, right? So Black Strakona, Hogan's Alley used to be black space that existed. It was literally leveled. And most people, most black people know about Africville in Nova Scotia. Most black people, most Canadians don't know about Hogan's Alley, about Black Strathcona, and the fact that this population, which was mixed, but included the largest um, black population in, in, in BC was actually erased and people were dispersed. 
And in terms of population, we are negligible. We are less than 1% of the BC population. So for a population of British Columbia, which is about 5 million people, for Metro Vancouver, which is about 2.5 million people, for the city of Vancouver, which is about 675,000 people, the total black population in BC is about 46,000, the entire British Columbia. So this low number, this lack of black space, this history that has been erased, makes it easy for these three forms of racism, anti-black racism that I'm speaking about uh, work and work so well. It facilitates anti-black racism of erasure, of forgetting, of denial, and also of the episodic, blatant, grotesque versions. So if I can speak to one of the forms of denial which is related to history, we have very interesting ways. Most people don't know about the, the black history uh, in BC. So we do, one of the things that is very interesting is people might know maybe about the African rifles or about black settlers um, of Salt Spring Island. Then it seems as if there's just this gap and all of a sudden people speak about refugees from Africa. So we don't have a continuous history. And this is really interesting. That, that lack of continuous history is done for a particular reason, is to delegitimate the black presence, is to assert to us that we have just arrived. Some of us, yes, have just arrived like myself, but this erasure of a continuous black history is actually very wonderful in the way that it works. So there's also that black sarcona that I mentioned when I say erasure, literal erasure. The, the, community, the, the community was bulldozed to make way for an aqueduct. And I want to get finally to the issue of the denial of racism. And I'll give a very specific example. Um, at a local school, Lord Bain Secondary School, a white boy, and you will have to forgive my language, but I need to quote him directly. A white boy made a video and made the statement. I hate niggers. I hope all niggers die. I just want to line them all up and just chuck an explosive in there and go kaboom. This was said by a white youth in the context of his school. Now, black, two black girls who were in that school were completely traumatized by this statement. And because nothing was being done or nothing was being done fast enough, their parents removed them from that school. This is how anti-black racism works. So the victim has to move. And then those, the parents of those two girls, one is a white woman, so the kid is mixed race, and the other is a black woman. They went to the Vancouver School Board. They went to the Vancouver Police Department. They went to the BC Human Rights Commission. So black people have to do all that work to undo the racism that is leveled against them. And the main way this issue has been taken up is that he's a young man who made a stupid mistake. So there's a denial of racism and it is renamed as a mistake. And then the person who pays for this is actually the black person. This is the work that we have to do, not only to be the victims of racism, okay. but to fix things that have, that have been done. So these are the forms, if you remember them, erasure, forgetting, denial, as well as the blatant and violent forms of racism. Ashe, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, the last person we bring to the uh, square table is Matt Thomas. Matt brings extensive experience and an excellent knowledge of the soccer landscape in Canada. He has previously worked with professional clubs in Europe and since landing in Canada has worked with British Columbia, Manitoba and Alberta provincial associations. Matt is a Canada soccer master coach developer, has his UEFA, USSFA and is currently completing his Canada soccer A license. 
He also has his Director of Coaching and National Youth Licence from the US Soccer Federation. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Valerie. And again, um, thank you to all the panellists. It's, it's, it's been quite the journey listening to everyone. So again, thank you. Um, I'm going to take everyone through a, a, a little journey um, and I'll, I'll arrive at the end with my why. Okay. So um, as you know, Valerie just mentioned there, um, um, have I been through racism? Yes. As everyone possibly on this call experienced in, in, in one form or the other. I've had people throw bananas at me, um, spit on me. I've had people, I have a scar on my head uh, where someone hit me over the head because they assumed I looked like someone I wasn't. But what I will say to you is I sit here on a Sunday morning with a heart filled with abundance of love. No matter what I've encountered, I sit here with that today. My role as a coach educator for this country um, this province, Alberta, and this country. I have people who come onto courses and sometimes they're there for two, three, or four days. But in order for me to take them on the journey and support them, one of the main things me and my team have to do is listen to who they are. And it comes back to society nowadays. If we just ram something down someone's throat, how can we take them along a journey? So my role is for that first couple hours is to listen to who they are, listen to what's coming from within their heart. When I have an understanding of that, it's easy for me to formulate and reframe things in alignment with how they think. So I've just heard from my brother Rico and, and my sister Afu, fantastic. We, 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 we keep speaking, we keep speaking. And they're right but maybe the way we're going about it is not the way that people learn. And we've got to start looking at that because again, the, what's, the, what's the phrase in insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. So somewhere along the line, we've got to step back and say, the message is probably correct and it is, but it's how we deliver it, how we connect with people. I've experienced a lot from being in Canada, and I still do. I, walk, I, you know, I walked into a hotel the other day and the woman looked at me and says, you're not intending to stay here, are you? You're not intending to stay here. I ended up reporting this woman and she, you know, she was under review and whatever. But I wanted to take it a step further. I wanted to have a conversation with this woman to dive into where, where that mindset come from. Because it's so easy for us to say, well, that person should be rep reprimanded, that person. But can we take it a step further in diving deeper with that person to help them with that mindset? And we all play a role with that. So when I hear power to the people, you, you, you're damn right. Because the media two, three weeks from now might move on to something else. And it's up to us to keep moving forward. Us to keep touching people's minds and hearts in the way that they learn. So I'm not talking at you right now, I'm talking with you. We have the power to do that. My brothers, my sisters, and I'm not talking my brothers and sisters from black, I'm talking all of us. Not only to set a course for society nowadays, but to set a course for future generations to come. Because what we've been doing hasn't worked. We've identified that. We've talked and we'll keep talking, but somewhere along the line, we've got to step back and say, can we approach it different? Let's get people doing things because they want to do it, not because they have to do it. So I'll leave you with this. The things we can learn from each other are far more powerful than the things we try to find wrong with each other. So I'll say it again one more time. The things we can learn from each other are far more powerful than the things we try to find wrong with each other. So again, connect with that, connect with that. People wanna take steps now. Let's help them with 
how we move forward. Because we've all identified it's there. But now people want to know, how do I help you move forward? How do I help us as a society move forward? So again, I thank you. I spread love. Thank you, Valerie. Ashe, thank you all. Just um, thank you so much, every single one of you. So in this last um, 20 minutes, we have space for question. Um, the first question I'm going to ask, and for people, if you want to ask a question, there is a Q&A tab. Please put your question in the Q&A tab. We won't see it. We'll miss it if it goes in the panelists and attendees tab. So who would like to respond to this question? What is the value of calling white privilege white? I, as a Chinese Canadian, frequently benefit by my ability to exercise many of those privileges we have described as being ascribed to white privilege. I fear that the term may cause alienation to prevent white communities from becoming our allies if the issue is black non-privilege versus white privilege. For example, we hear China's international engagement with African countries as an example of Chinese appropriation of African resources. Thank you for the consideration. Would you like to answer this question? I posit the question, you do not have to answer it. Is there somebody who would like to answer this question? Melinda. <clears throat> Thanks, for, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks for the question. One of the things I think I laid out when I discussed the def my definition of white privilege is that it's a system. <clears throat> and so you can be it, anyone who's in that system is impacted by it. Um, even if you refuse the framing of uh, white normativity, hegemonic whiteness, that's, that is how the system was structured. And so everyone, we can, whether you, even in those who are black and internalize racism and reproduce it, but even those who are anti-racist of different backgrounds, they still benefit from the privileges that accrue from the system because you're not outside the system. And so, so in a way, we, can, we can't ignore the fact that there was a hierarchy established that's still under colonial racism and the hierarchy put white people, culture, civilization on top. And we have made, and what Handel says about is that we have made a lot of effort to deny this rather than to transform it. So we must begin with acknowledging this hierarchy with what people in Alberta in the 1900s called the, the racial pecking order in the newspapers. The racial pecking order existed. It doesn't mean it has to continue existing, but we must begin with the fact that it exists and then figure out how to dismantle that system rather than personalizing it as uh, about individual prejudices or, 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 or biases. Thanks. Thank you, Melinda. And there's a question specific to you. Um, as we know, you will soon have a key equity position at the University of Calgary, an ocean of anti-Black racism. I myself have been suffering it. Any plans on how you will go about anti-Black racism at the University of Calgary? Um, thanks for that question. Um, I think I, I can build on my work that I have done at the University of Alberta here, but also with the um, the race, the critical, the race network, which is researchers and academics of color for um, uh, equity uh, and inclusion. And the race network is an un frames racism also in terms of anti-colonialism as well. So I don't want to prejudge what I uh, 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 lay out what I want to do at the University of Calgary without talking to colleagues there. It's, it's a delicate uh, 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 position. I'm not there yet. But I certainly believe that Canadian equity, diversity, inclusion policies have not included racial equity, that anti-racism is rarely, if ever, addressed by those policies. And even the anti-racism statements that were released recently few of any of those institutions actually talk to black professors, staff and students. So in a way, there is a lot of work to be done on racism and anti-racism and racial justice. 
and it has not been a priority focus of Canadian universities. And that's why we are underrepresented in the professoriate and certainly invis next to invisible in university leaderships. This has to change. There is no question about it. The denial has been pervasive. There's a fierce urgency of now to transform that. And that's what I will be advocating not just for the University of Calgary, but I think for every institution in Canada. There are no good cases of anti-racism in Canadian universities that I can think of. Maybe, I'm, maybe someone else has a better example. Thank you very much. Um, Kofi Sankofa, hi Kofi. Um, Kofi asks, how do we destroy white supremacy racism of the face of the earth? Dr. Cooper, Kofi is calling you in. Unmute. Okay. Unmute. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kofi, for your question. Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Unmute. Yeah. Um, so I want want to thank give thanks for that question. There, there it's um, first of all, white supremacy is a, a many headed, headed hydra, and so it's gonna call for a many headed solution, uh, different forms of solution. Look, throughout the, 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 what we call the classic civil rights era, the 50s, the 60s, perhaps in the 70s, we have people like um, Kwame Toure, we have people like Angela Davis, Asata Shakur, the Black Panthers, MLK, um, Malcolm X, and, and you know, so many people. Uh, all, all across the world, all across the world, in, in the Caribbean, Michael Manley, Fidel Castro, if we think of the Bandung Conference in, in Indonesia in 1955, where people put forth all kinds of solutions. Some were, um, some materialized, some didn't. So the question is, in, in this present moment, in this, uh, this psychological time, what, what uh, heartens me about, or, or why I'm heartened about the, the protests is that people are not stopping and we cannot, we cannot stop. We simply, and we see by continuing the marches, continuing the letter writings, continuing the interviews, continuing um, forums like this one that, that we're doing now, we have to hold the politicians accountable. Coming back to this whole idea of the power of rest with the people, when people, when we realize that we are the ones who, um, when we, we talk about the commonwealth, what does the commonwealth really mean? It means what it says, the commonwealth. The wealth belongs to the people. We pay taxes, we vote, for example. Yet our, our monies, our taxes are used against us. We build up police budgets. We um, and the, to buy more guns and tasers and build more, uh, you know, super, super jails and prisons, more sophisticated jails and prisons. Now, when we can say this is our tax uh, dollar that you're spending, and we want to hold you more accountable of how this money is spent, of how this money is spent against our people, against black people in, in, in this case. So one, hold the politicians accountable, hold the police departments accountable, and look, Federal governments, the federal government in Canada is very powerful. It has a lot of power. The federal government is not a weak government. The Can Canadian Con Confederation is very strong. And so we also have to put the feet of the federal government to this perhaps metaphorical fire um, and say, as Jagmeet Singh stated the, the other day, the leader of the NDP, the federal government could end racial profiling right now right now the federal government has jurisdiction over CSIS, the rcmp and over a large portion of the justice system and of the police services in canada if prime minister trudeau was to take up the pen right now and say i want to end racial profiling against black people all the monies that we are funneling into these super super police budgets we're going to invest them uh, these monies in black communities to build employment capacities to build educational capacities to build health capacities we know our people are overrepresented in you, you know certain uh, chronic diseases uh, like um 
AIDS, HIV, diabetes, hypertension, and now, you know, the whole COVID thing, we know about that. So we have, we go there and vote. And even if we don't vote, we are citizens. We pay taxes. And in Nova Scotia, we pay a lot of taxes, right? It's 15% sales, provincial sales tax plus federal tax. So it's hold people's feet, holding people's feet to the fire and educating ourselves on so many of, uh, on these issues that we're talking about. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions around um, health care. Please comment on experiences of black, brown peoples as they encounter the Canadian healthcare system. And the other one, which is by defining racism within the frame of mental illness and as a public health issue, can we cure implicit bias of law enforcement and large governing institutions? Is there anybody who would like to speak to that question? Um, Melinda. I mean, I think one of the things that the COVID-19 uh, experience has shown us, I mean, it's actually led to the term of a concept like COVID racism, but that's not racism unique to COVID-19 moment. It's racism that, that was there, a pre-existing condition, and often it gets played out with the anti with the racism experienced by Asians uh, in, in Alberta, Filipinos, in, in, in some in some meat packing plants, people of Sudanese descent. Um, but as, as I said, I keep wanting to emphasize and, and give a shout out to Bashir Mohammed uh, in Alberta, uh, uh, who has been documenting this history of racism in Alberta since well, 19, um, 1900s onwards, including in the police in our institutions. So ra racism in the health system leads to health disparities. There's also the problem that we don't, even, we don't collect race-based or disaggregated data. And so oh, even at the very, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. It doesn't, we, we don't get to see the ways in which it dis disproportionately impacts people. I gave an example on Twitter, I think uh, yesterday in which I, oh, I got Oh, you've broken up, Melinda. Can you, um, you've broken up. Okay, um, can you still hear me? Yeah, just making sure it's not my end. But it's at the bottom from here, there's always a priority. So I think we need, the racism is systemic. So it means in every institution we encounter, we experience anti-blackness, we, we experience this marginality and so the question about, I mean, someone, I saw someone, but we aren't answering the question about how you dismantle white supremacy. I use, I like to use language of white normativity or hegemonic whiteness because it's, because those who experience it, it's invisible to them. So we have to always continually be having, having to expose the ways in which it functions, but the burden falls on black people and it falls on people of color. Mm -hmm. And we are saying we are tired and it's time for change. So white people, uh, who are who are who are have the honor and privilege need to do more to dismantle the system. I mean, the people in education, universities, schools, the police, the government, actually speaking up and working to transform and dismantle the system. And so far, I've seen statements, I've seen gestures, I have not seen any systematic emphasis to dismantle the system. I have not seen them put their money where their mouths are. So they have not endorsed this change. Thank you. So I'm just aware of time. We're, we're coming to um, a final question and I'd like everybody to speak to this, to have a couple of sentences on this question. How can several people have asked this questions in, in, in different ways. It's around allyship. How can Canadian non-black POCs white people be allies on a daily basis in our communities and places of work. Actionable takeaways, really helpful. So um, who would, um, I'll, I'll go around the, the screen. Rico. Yeah. Are you, are you hearing me yet? Yeah? yeah. Okay. First of all, <clears throat> any allies coming in um, to work with us, it must be unconditional. It mustn't be conditional on whether or not 
we express passion or emotion, nor whether or not we have some violence involved. They cannot dictate to us how to solve this matter when we are the ones who have been suffering and they have had, I will repeat, 500 years to have solved that um, and work with it, but have not. And definitely, we don't want no conditions if you want to be an ally. You will not come and dictate to us how to go. And you must be a follower, not a leader, if you're coming in to, um, to ally with us. We've taken the brunt of this. And whether or not is the police chief um, taking a knee or marching, all that is tomfoolery. We're not going to be fooled by that. Don't believe the hype. Don't. Don't believe the hype. Only we ourselves can free ourselves. And if you want to help, then you follow um, in our footsteps. Not, we will not be dictated by any ally. Any ally. We will not be dictated by them as to what um, a procedure to take in terms of our own liberation. Thank you. OK. Let's have a deal. Um, I would say that uh, we need to not tolerate racism anymore. I think there needs to be an intolerance for racism. I think it needs to be widespread. Um, you know, this is, we're dealing with power structures, we're dealing with institutions, um, you know, we're dealing with um, lethal force, you know, the police are authorized to use lethal weapons. So uh, it's going to take all of us to really agree to have an intolerance for racism. And I think we need to specifically call out anti-Black racism. I think uh, sometimes we can use these incidents to point out what's happening in our own communities of color. Um, but I think we really need to pay attention to and speak out against specifically anti-Black racism. And all of us need to show zero tolerance for anti-Black racism. Thank you. Matt. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question to, and it's a complex question and it's not one you can just put into a few sentences. But what I would say is, is obviously, and I'll, I'll talk on what I just talked on a, a while ago, is someone doing something because they want to do it, not because they have to do it. There's a massive mindset that comes with that. Um, educating someone, sharing, um, acknowledgement, um, for them then to move on and do something because they want to do it, I think is powerful. So yes, I, I hear we say, you know, um, we don't want them leading on all of that stuff. But again, it just comes down to people doing something because they want to do it, not because they have to do it. Those things carry a mindset and we've got to start thinking differently. Because I have people out there who are doing things because they want to. Sometimes they don't tell me, but they're doing it. And it's they're doing it for the better of themselves and they're doing it for the betterment of things to come, hopefully. And they're doing it because they have to do it, not because I told them to do it. I've given them the framework, I've given them some tools, I've given them the support, but they've gone out and done it because they want to do it. Okay. Thank you. Handel. Yeah, th this is a really important question. Uh, it's good we're ending on this. There are bad ways to be an ally and there are good ways to be an ally. Um, bad ways to be an ally could be um, ignoring the oppressed as you take on the issues yourself. Um, feeling good about being an ally, getting into it because it makes you feel good. Um, not staying the course, uh, being a short-term uh, short ally. Um, leaping onto leadership roles. My people say you do not go to a funeral and go and cry more than the bereaved. So those kinds of things are what make for bad allyship. What makes for good allyship is how one uses one's power and authority. Are you making space for those people that you're being allies with? Are you helping to empower them? Are you willing to have some humility to listen, to learn about the issues, rather than to think that you already know. Are you willing to follow, um, um, uh, as Ras Rico said, rather than to be to in insist that you be the leader? Are you about inclusion on several other issues? Are you willing to use your power for a kind of what Paul Ferry called conscientization, being aware of who you are and how you are situated and how you can help others? 
But I also want to mention that allyship is not just something that we want from others. We also need to be allies because we are now talking about anti-Black racism, which is very true, which is very good. We need to also consider ourselves in the IBPOC uh, acronym, which is Indigenous Black and People of Color. So we also need to be there to stand up for other groups when they are being discriminated against. So there is anti-Asian racism, which is also going on right now, where um, Asians have gone from being the yellow peril to the model minority, and now back to being the yellow peril. We should be also ready to support others. We are weary and we are tired. We cannot do all the work on our own. So we need allies, but we also need to be ready to be allies. Thank you. Afua. Yes, thank you, Valerie. I, I just want to say, I, I, allyship is a process. Um, it's not just something that you become an ally today and you're an instant ally. Allies have to, to study, to learn, to engage in deep conversations with, the, with their families, with their colleagues, with their friends, with their coworkers, their, the, the, the white people they are around, and also with the black and other non-white people, black and other non-white colleagues, friends, coworkers. We have to begin to have these deep conversations. One way I, because uh, someone had called me about this two days ago, and I said to this person, Read the Halifax Street Check Report. If you don't know what to do, if you want to be, be an ally to the Black community, read the Halifax Street Check Report. Engage in a conversation, read the report with your friends, with your colleagues, and so on. What does it mean that in a city like Halifax, where I live, Black men are nine times uh, more likely, not even more likely, Black men are nine times street checked. This is a fact, than men of any other color, race, ethnicity, whatever. What does it mean for you as a white person that this is happening in your community? And there are tons of other reports out there, are tons. We have produced so many reports uh, for the past 50 years with respect to anti-Black racism. So read those reports, engage with your, with your fellow white people. If you don't have a, a, a Black friend or colleague, find one. Um, because, you know, we're all in this, together. And I do agree with what Handel said about uh, we also have to be allies to other people. But just one thing, though, is that Black people have been allies with other people throughout these past 200 years, let's say. Um, and sometimes we don't see it, uh, it um, reciprocated. Uh, you know, I think of how Angela Davis has put her life, her career, her well-being, Dudley Laws, um, Rocky Jones, and other people being allies to other ethnicities. But when black people are shut down in the streets, oftentimes we don't see, we don't see that allyship from other ethnicities. So I wanna put it out there to other ethnicities uh, because black people have paid the way for civil rights on this continent. And um, we, we, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see how we put ourselves on the line out there for civil rights for ourselves and everyone else. But when it comes for people to be an ally to us, it, um, that's not reciprocated. Having said that, though, I must say in this new dispensation of protest, we're seeing a lot of um, multicultural folks, different races, um, out there, different ethnicities marching with Black people here in Halifax, Toronto, Wolfville, Vancouver, uh, Minneapolis, um, France, Berlin, um, Rio de Janeiro, wherever. So it, it is a hopeful time we're living in. Thank you. Neil. Yeah, um, you know, I don't want to repeat with things that were mentioned, a lot of amazing points. Um, but to me, like when I think of allyship, it's like, it's, it's, to me, it seems kind of simple, you know, it's just really being a good friend. Like, how do you show up for your friend in um you know in crisis or 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 whatever or like how are you, how do you advocate for family members or whatnot you know you see some some kind of injustice something wrong you step up for that um as for like you know the like the concept of allyship um that that needs to be like embedded in in lifestyle you know just like what was mentioned before it's an ongoing process um the same way how how people have you know their their yoga routine or their you know their their their, their health and fitness routine process 
anti-black racism allyship needs to be embedded in that as well you know um essentially like like love black people the way you love black culture you know what i mean like to me it's very very simple um actions need to be heart-centered you know uh, we got to be contributing to like the healing right you know um the foundation of it is, is humanity it's a commitment to humanity but we have to get through all these layers first you know what i mean so i i really feel that it's um it's a, it's a lifestyle and yeah allies have to bring these conversations into white spaces spaces that that we don't we don't exist in you know what i mean go go, go talk to your racist uncle instead of being passive and being like oh that's just uncle bill he just is who he is no deal with it right now that's what time it is you know what i mean so um, for, for me, it's just really being a good friend, you know what I'm saying? And that's the kind of, you know, people I want around me. Um, from Stolen from Africa, we're, we're going to be creating like, like an ally group. And there's going to be a lot of like, you know, action items attached to that. You know what I mean? It's, it's not just, uh, just showing fakes. It's like we're actually going to be making some change, you know what I mean? So, so that, that's what it is, man. Be a good friend. Love Black people like you love Black culture. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Melinda. I think being an ally means uh, learning to have kind of a radical empathy for black people, but also people of color. Because um, I actually think when black people are dehumanized, treat demeaned and treated so, uh, uh, it's, if, it's, if it's not noticed, there's a, uh, there's a way of making us appear, not just in, not inhumane treatment, but unhuman. So what that requires of allies, I think, is to, is to, is to step up, is to uh, speak up and speak out and, and not to become complicit in that by true silence. It also means refusing, to, again, to go back to my uh, comments about institution, it means refusing to sit at tables or on panels where there are no black people or people of color. It, it means actually speaking to fellow white peers your family members about what's said around the dinner table or in social groups. Yes, this comes with risk and often people avoid doing it, but black people don't, or people of color don't have access to, access to those spaces in the way in which allies presumably do. So it also means not speaking for us or about us, but speaking to us. And again, I go back to those anti-racism statements that universities issued and whether in fact they ever consulted the black faculty, staff, and students, or the broader community. So it just can't be moments of great disruption. It has to be continuous, ongoing. It's more than tweeting or retweeting or sharing Facebook posts. It actually means actions. And I think if you are, if you are in the struggle for justice and fairness, you're not just an ally to black people or BIPOC people, you're an ally to yourself. And so any removal from yeah. the struggle for uh, anxiety racism is a removal from the struggle for justice and a fair life. So to me, you can't be anti-racism, anti-racist, unless you are part of the struggle for justice. Thank you. Um, before we end this with a poem from Dr. Afua Cooper, I just want to say thank you to a white ally who um, made it possible for us to use the webinar. Lauren Carter, I just mm. met her once and I just emailed out to her and said, hey, can we use your webinar? There was no question about it. She just got straight back and said, yes. So thank you to Lauren Carter for your allyship. And one of the things I say is, what if, what if we took a leaf from the Me Too movement? What if, what if the police started outing police? What if? That would be a start <laughs> that actually if the police started outing police for their racism that would be a start because it's the only way it's going to change in that system yeah. mm. so uh i want to say a big up a, a big up to george elliott clark who couldn't stay he, he he left a bit earlier a big up to matt thomas a big up to dr melinda smith a big up to idil a big up to dr handel wright to dr fua cooper to neil logic to Rico John. Another big up to Idil who just created these posters, just, just put these posters together. A big up to Afua. I wrote to Afua and George and said, what are we going to do? And just uh, a big up to helping me get this panel together. So 
thank you each and every one of you for the work that you do i know that these conversations will continue may you as white people who are listening begin to have these conversations without us being there perhaps show this show this recording and have a conversation about it Amazing. okay so um let's Valerie, can i just say one thing can i say thank you to you um again because again you're giving out all this love and praise me personally and hopefully i speak from everyone else thank you this is the first time i've actually spoke about anything like this in 35 years so thank you thank you yeah thank and you. Could, could i can i just give one more shout out i got a big up a deal um she's actually one of my high school classmates from way back in the day <laughs> you reached out for me to be part of this panel oakwood collegiate you don't know so i got a big up man so salute and i'm, I'm so grateful to be part of this let's keep connected fantastic Okay, so let's, um, let's, Afua. So yeah, so the poem is, I don't care if your nanny was black. And I, I wrote this poem over 20 years ago. In fact, in the poem, I referenced to the Donald Trump taking out an ad in the New York Times calling for the death penalty for the Central Park Five. Those five young black men who were accused of raping a white woman in Central Park and, and um, of course, they, they, well, I shouldn't say of course, but the fact is they didn't do it. And they spent many, many years in prison. Ava DuVernay just did a film on them. And, um, but the, another context was the Michael Griffith, a black man in Queens was killed by some white youths in a, in a white neighborhood murdered. He came out of his car, he was murdered. And at the same time, Tawana Brawley was a 16-year-old black woman who was raped by four cops, uh, NYPD cops. So um, that was the context of the poem. And then uh, many white people were saying, well, we're not racist because, you know, our nanny was black. So that's the title of the poem. So I don't care if your nanny was black and you ate grits for breakfast every morning, and you knew a black girl in high school, and she was your best friend, and she was nice. I don't care, you hear? I don't care, because Michael Griffin is dead, killed by white youths who got off free, even though witnesses testified to their crime. While Donald Trump takes out a three-page ad in the New York Times calling for the deaths of five youths, calling for the lynching of five black youths whom he said raped a white woman in Central Park. While black, the cops who raped black woman Tawana Brawley is still out on the streets. So I don't care. You hear? I don't care. So when you hear black pain and you feel black anger, you raise your hand in exasperation and all this guilt pours from your mouth. You start to tell the audience that you're not a racist because your nanny was black and you ate grits for breakfast every morning and you knew a black girl in high school and she was your best friend and she was nice. I don't care, you hear? I don't care because for too long we've held our pain in our very flesh. For too long our beating hearts in our chests. For too long our eyes have seen what they can no longer bear to see. Our anger will rise like a red flood and uh, spread across this land. Tear down monuments built on our blood and cast away false idols. And we will, we will, we will tear down the walls, tear down the walls, tear down the walls of this Jericho, of this Toronto. So I don't care if your nanny was black and she ate grits for breakfast every morning and she knew a black girl in high school and she was your best friend and she was nice i don't care you hear i don't care me no care me no care me no care me no care i don't care you hear i don't care thank you end. thank you and as I look at this screen and I witness Neil's daughter in front of us, may we make Canada a safe space for this new 
generation of black and brown bodies moving in the world. Because one thing that I want to say to those white people who are listening right now, it has been a shitty couple of weeks for those of us in black and brown bodies. It's been a painful week. We, people we haven't heard from are just communing. We've got in touch with each other. We're crying, we're holding each other together. Just know that this has been a really painful time for us. We have been activated. We have been triggered. So just, yeah. Again, may we make Canada a safe space for this new generation of black and brown bodies who are going to be walking the world. Thank you. Blessings, Ashe. Thank you. Over and out. <laughs>